Top of the morning to you. This is Tacky Ty. Today we are looking at this pretty much the pathway to victory for Napoleon. Uh, this is Napoleon's first victory, the Battle of Toulon. And again, this is from Epic History TV. Be sure to check out the link down in the description down below. Give them the love and support that they well deserve. Also, if you have any other feature video topics that you'd like to suggest, let me know over on my Patreon or my Discord. And let's get started. Let's check out the Battle of Toulon. 1793. In the summer of 1793, the French Revolution was entering its fourth year, and France was on the verge of anarchy. In Paris, political extremists had seized control of the revolution. Yeah, France is not a place you'd want to be back in the late 18th century. They guillotined the king and imposed a reign of terror that dealt summary justice to all suspected enemies of the revolution. Yeah, it's such a strong political ideology that where literally like every few minutes it said the guillotine would swing just constant just like constant flow of heads being chopped off basically hoping to unify the new republic france's leaders had declared war on the habsburg empire hmm. but the conflict quickly widened and soon france was facing the combined might of europe's leading powers determined to stamp out her dangerous political experiment yeah because i mean that's really the, the fervor of democratization, uh, just because all of these other countries are absolute monarchies or some other form of a monarchy. And really, France set the, planted the seed of the idea of not having a king. And, I mean, well, they, they revolted and chopped their king's head off and put it on a spec. So, I mean, that's... Uh, so all of the other monarchs at the time were like, no, we can't have this. And, I mean, it's... The reign of terror Meanwhile, begins. whole regions of France had come out in open revolt, horrified by the new extremism of the revolution. Yeah. In August, the Republic suffered a further, potentially fatal blow when the city of Toulon joined the revolt. Toulon was France's largest and most important naval base in the south, home to a third of the entire French navy. Yep. But now, rebels welcomed their old enemy, the British Royal Navy, into the port, led by Admiral Lord Hood, aboard HMS Victory. It was an extraordinary... That's blasphemy. Really, especially from the culture of, like, it's it's no secret that France and Britain, or the English, have always kind of been at odds historically for for a long, long time, and so just almost overnight to invite the English in to basically take hold of your city and port uh, and open the gates with open arms. Um, made a lot of people mad. A coup. Without a shot being fired, the Allies had crippled French naval power in the Mediterranean and gained a vital toehold on the French coast. Yeah. All French forces in the area were immediately diverted to face this new threat. And there was and a lot of to the loyalists too, that were loyal to the monarch and the, the idea of a monarchy. Uh, because really, all of this was just extreme fanaticism and just like basically ideological fervor uh, to the point where like it, it spread like wildfire literally through all of these other countries that are trying to face France at the time. Uh, they're all also suppressing their own revolts just from that same ideology. Rebel port. 19,000 troops in all, 
but since most French officers had been aristocrats who were now fleeing the revolution in... Especially in 1842. That's basically all of these things. Like, even though this is still a good 50 years before that, uh, really, that's why, like, 1850, 1842 is so well-known. It's because that's when finally all of the kindling erupted at once all over Europe. Large numbers, they were seriously short of professional leadership. Their commander, General Jean-Francois Carteau, was a loyal Republican, but a court painter by trade with no military training. Hmm. To make matters worse, one of his few professional officers, his artillery commander, Colonel Don Martin, had been badly wounded on the approach to Toulon. Rough. Antoine Salicetti, a Corsican deputy of the National Convention in Paris, recommended as his replacement a fellow countryman, a 24-year-old artillery officer who was passing Toulon en route to the front, named Napoleone Buonaparte. Buonaparte. Bonaparte. Captain Bonaparte. Bonaparte was a professional soldier but he'd seen almost no active service. Nevertheless, Salicetti was impressed by his manner, and most of all, his politics. Bonaparte had just written a political pamphlet, a short story about a young artillery officer who berates his fellow diners for their disloyalty to the Republic. General ha, ha, ha. Carto thought it wise to accept Deputy Salicetti's recommendation. One can remain 24, or if necessary, 36 hours without eating. The great port of Toulon was well defended by... But don't tell your troops that, because an army marches on its stomach. If they go 24 hours or 36 hours without eating, uh, especially if you're a commander, you're, you're almost probably going to have a mutiny on your hands. ...by city walls and a dozen outlying forts and redoubts. They were held by 2,000 British soldiers and sailors. That's a pretty well defended 6, city 6,000 Spanish troops, 6,000 near. Most cities wouldn't have that many redoubts. Politans and 800 Sardinians. Artillery would be the key to overcoming these formidable defenses. Especially the hills. But when Bonaparte was put in command on of the, the artillery side. on the 16th of September, he found himself with few cannon, not enough trained gun crews, yeah. and a shortage of gunpowder and shot. And that, that's rough, especially for an artillery commander, to not have any cannons. I mean, come on. That's, uh, that's, your, that's your specialty. With relentless energy and determination, Bonaparte transformed the situation, requisitioning unused guns, yep. training infantrymen to work them, setting up a new forge and workshop, and arranging transport from Marseille of 100,000 sandbags for constructing new batteries. Good. Through hard work, he was ultimately able to build his force up to 64 officers and 1,500 men, manning 100 cannon, howitzers, and mortars. So that's impressive, to not really have any artillery or firepower and to quickly assemble it and forge it since you don't have it because you know this is a well defended city so okay if we're going to capture this uh, you have to have the firepower and especially going up also against the the English too they bring one of their they have one of their capital ships with them too so and can within days can Bonaparte had more. established two new forward batteries with good revolutionary names, La Montagne and Sans Culottes. Yeah, and especially, that's one of the, the, the things that really Napoleon was well renowned for is, is instilling that loyalty and fervor in his men to take that risk and put their life on the line just through what he would name certain positions where like, because th I'm sure the, these positions are well within firing range of the English and loyalists. 
And so just renaming it something that in, that basically entitles that any man that's manning those cannon are super brave. Um, because I mean that's really the the epitome of a soldier's life is is uncanny loyalty and bravery, which brought Toulon's inner harbor within range, and forced Admiral Hood to move all his ships closer to the port. Right, that's good. Bonaparte also came up with a plan, one that would allow the French to bypass most of Toulon's defenses and secure the rapid victory the Republic so desperately needed. Bonaparte argued yeah. that if, if Fort can, Leguilet... Yeah, if you can capture that point, then you basically have command of that full harbour. ...could be captured, which looked out across the harbour. He could fill it with heavy guns and shell the British and Spanish fleet at anchor. Boom. That's impressive. Admiral Hood would be forced to abandon... That's just within range, too. ...to the port and take with him the Allied soldiers that Toulon relied on for its defence. Mm. General a, Carteau saw the merits of Bonaparte's plan. It's a tough fortified and on the 22nd position, of September, French forces attacked Montcaire. But to Bonaparte's exasperation, while he'd argued for an attack by 3,000 men, the indecisive Carteau committed only 400. Especially being a captain, not a commander. Not only was the attack easily repulsed, but it alerted the Allies to the danger. Yeah. Within 48 hours, they'd reinforced Montcair with thousands more troops and built a new fort named Fort Mulgrave, bristling with 20 cannon. Rough. The position was now so strong, the French nicknamed it Little Gibraltar. Hmm. There's only one possible plan. Bonaparte. Finally, in mid-November, an experienced professional soldier arrived to take command of French forces. General Dugomier. Hmm. He saw at once that Bonaparte's plan was the only way to take Toulon, and gave it his full backing. Bonaparte promoted to Major, got to work, go. overseeing construction of several more batteries in preparation for the decisive assault. One forward battery was so exposed to enemy fire that men refused to be sent there. So Bonaparte renamed it La Batterie des Hommes Sans Peur. The Men Without Fear. The Battery of Men Without Fear. Yeah. And suddenly, there was no shortage of volunteers. Yeah, see? See how he can instill that loyalty and bravery on his men just through simple tactics, really, and social engineering. It was an early display of Napoleon's genius for inspiring his soldiers. One that would serve him well in the years ahead. On the 30th of November, the Allied Land Forces commander, British General Charles O'Hara, tried to seize back the initiative, leading an assault on the new French batteries facing Fort Malbousquet. At first the attack was successful. The batteries were overrun, the French guns spiked. Hmm. But a counter-attack with much greater numbers, and led in person by General Dugomier and Major Bonaparte, drove back the Allies. Good. Yeah, because can't lose those cannon. General O'Hara himself was shot through the hand and captured. Oh, wow. Twelve years before, he'd surrendered to George Washington at Yorktown during the American War of Independence. Now he got to surrender to Napoleon Bonaparte. Wow. What a, what a what a legacy to have too, in history, to be the the captain or commander known for surrendering to both a leader of the first democratic fought war of independence, 
against your empire, uh, the Americans, George Washington, and to Napoleon. In the early hours of the 18th of December, in howling wind and driving rain, how the French not launched... long ago this was either. Like really, this was not very long ago at all. Especially just in history's eye, it's a blink of an eye. Yet this seems so far, and I mean this whole era is named after him, to have one, the influence of one man dictate and really kind of ripple out so much. And we'll see that here in the next like 50 to 100 years. Uh, as I mentioned before, that year 1842, I mean, if it wasn't for Napoleon, um, who knows how things would have went and what that would have led to today a major assault on Fort Mulgrave. The wet conditions made muskets useless except as clubs or with bayonets. Wow, rough. Bonaparte led the second wave in person. Amid fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting, his horse was killed under him and he was bayoneted in the thigh by a British sergeant, a wound that came within inches of ending his life and radically changing the course of history. Finally, the Allied garrison was overwhelmed, and Mulgrave fell to the French. There you go. Fort Leguilette and Tour de la Balakière were soon also in French hands. By the following afternoon, the French had ten heavy guns in Leguilette, placing the Allied ships within range. Oh. Admiral Hood to start shelling. But could not expose his valuable ships of the line to such a threat. Yeah. He had no option but to order an immediate evacuation of the fleet and garrison from Toulon. Small Spanish and British teams raced to destroy all the French ships and naval stores that they couldn't take with them. But amid the chaos of their departure, 18 ships of the line were allowed to fall back into French hands. Wow. A badly missed opportunity. Yeah, that's rough. I mean, especially you're already abandoning the city, trying to torch everything you can before you leave, and to miss that opportunity of, of not of allowing your enemy to get top quality equipment and well, as he said, ships of the line. These are these are top notch too, and I mean they're not easy to re easy to replace. Many French citizens of Toulon were desperate to escape aboard the Allied ships. Yeah, and, and I mean the Allied ships, they can't take civilians. So really, all civilians left over are usually at the mercy, are always at the mercy of the incoming army, and usually they're. Not very kind. Knowing that the Republicans would inflict terrible reprisals on the city. Yeah. British and Spanish ships took as many as they could. However long they let the soldiers pillage and loot and everything else that men do in war. So, About 14,000 in all, but scores were drowned amid chaotic and desperate scenes. Others were left to face the wrath of the revolution. And especially in the height of the re Republican revolution. troops entered the city the next morning, and executions and firing squads began almost immediately. Yep. Have the guillotine pulled out and just non-stop swinging up and down firing squads. It's a, it's a rough beat. For the next two weeks, about 200 were executed every day. Allied propaganda later blamed Rough. Bonaparte for the atrocities, but there's no evidence he was directly involved. Wow. France's young republic was now fighting back on all fronts. And with the fall of Toulon, the Allies had lost a golden opportunity a chance to stir up further revolt, 
deal a lasting blow to French naval power. Yeah, because that was really kind of a big shifting point, because at this point, mu much of the South was actually still to the Allies and loyalists to the Crown, even though the Crown is no longer around. Um, and so that was really kind of the big backing where it's okay that you're surrounded, allies are here, you got allied troops all throughout the country, uh, especially in the southern half. And yeah, and to lose Toulon, that's like the biggest port there is in the south. Um, so. Perhaps even overturn the revolution. But instead, the French Republic had weathered one of its greatest storms in no small part thanks to the remarkable judgment, energy and courage of one 24-year-old artillery officer, now promoted Brigadier General in recognition of his extraordinary Brigadier. service at Toulon. That's a big promotion too, from, from Captain to Major to Brigadier, especially all in one battle. That's, that's jumping up the ranks. Napoleon Bonaparte had taken his first step on the path to greatness. And for Europe, 21 years of almost constant war awaited. Yeah. Our sponsor, Osprey Publishing, has nearly 200 titles on the Napoleonic Wars alone. Yeah, and check out Osprey Publishing. They have a lot of cool stuff. Uh, I mean, especially even just their art artwork is phenomenal. Um, it's really some of the best kind of artistic artwork and like full in-depth essays uh, really on a lot of these historical topics that I've, I've really kind of seen around. So I highly encourage you to check them out. And again, as always, be sure to go down to the link down in the description down below to check out Epic History TV. Uh, give them like and subscribe love and support that they well deserve because they are awesome and I'm very appreciative that they make awesome videos that I like to watch. Uh, and as always, let me know what other future videos you'd like to suggest over on my Patreon and I will see you on the next one. Cheers.